Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Pour forth your Spirit, O Lord, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank, thank you all. It is good to see you tonight, everyone, for coming. I'm thinking that maybe my homily worked a little bit on Sunday. Um, not that it was intentionally organized for this purpose, um, and, and I can claim that. It, it seemed like a good opportunity, but it fits so well doing this series this time of year. Uh, because one of the things, and I learned this last year, this is my second time doing this as a five-week series. So I was tempted to, earlier I went back, and last year I recorded and we posted on the parish website, and I went back to listen to it, to take notes for this time. I was very tempted to think, I did okay. I'm just going to play the video and sit back. Okay. That's why we do this. No, I, so we're doing the video um, so that we can also, we'll make it available through the My Parish app. Um, anybody in the parish can watch it and put it on the YouTube channel uh, as a way to also see how that works and in the future for being able to post and share things. Because I know also as much as you all want to be here for everything and every time there's something, there are family events and things come up. Um, at sometimes we can't always be there and you know if the pandemic did something well it taught me how to use videos and even Facebook live on that so um, and I mentioned so that this was the perfect a good time of year for this and it comes from because St. John Chrysostom on a homily he did for the first Sunday of Lent for the readings that we had this past Sunday. He raised the very good question of why did Jesus have to undergo the temptation? Why did he have to go into the desert? Why did he have to have such for us in Holy Scripture a visible overcoming and defeat of Satan because he defeated him long ago? Not only that, but when he descended after his death, he descended into Hades, he overcame death. So why this encounter? And what John Chrysostom said in his homily was, he wanted us to know that this was not going to be an easy life. That the spiritual life is a battle, that it is hard. Lest we think that and become lax and easy thinking, oh, I've been baptized, I've been saved, our Lord has saved us, so I don't need to worry about it. And sit back and rest on our laurels. But so that we would see that there is an actual spiritual warfare. And it is, I know the popular thing, and our way of taking spiritual warfare today is in the rosary and the St. Michael prayer, primarily the primary tools or weapons. Okay. And that is a big part of it because we do have those times, we do have spiritual battles, spiritual encounters. There is, exorcists will talk about one of the reasons why they have to perform exorcism more often, more frequently on the same people and why their prayers are actually less effective today than they were, say, 100 years ago, or maybe even 50 years ago, is because the church prays less. Because the church, part of our spiritual battle is, as we pray and as the rosary is prayed, it's like filling up that well of energy. So that when the exorcists go to tap into that, there is less prayer, less strength there. So there is a reality. But what St. John and, and the early church fathers and throughout and the saints realize is that is just one part of spiritual warfare. That hand-to-hand -hand battle combat. 
that actually spiritual warfare is the whole of spiritual, our spiritual life, our spiritual journey. That the discernment of spirits isn't just about that maybe we can't have this Hollywoodized, I'm trying, I can't, I'm falling flat on the word I want to use. So my discernment saying God doesn't want me to use it. But it's just not all the flashy things and in the moment. That it's everything that involves the spiritual life. It's becoming more and more aware of that reality of God's presence. Because that is actually what it can all come down to is being aware of and walking in the presence of God. And a first step in that, and this is why discernment is so important, and we've lost so much when we've lost the practice of the discernment of spirits, is being aware of what are the spiritual things happening and going on. In the homily I talked about Sunday, about it's discerning who is doing the speaking. Where is this voice coming from? You know, is this the voice of the Spirit telling me that I should quit my job, pack, in, pack everything I have in my car, or at least enough to survive for a few months, and go down and help after Hurricane Katrina? Or, you know, is it the Holy Spirit telling me I should pack up everything that I own, and move out to North Carolina where I have a good friend at the food bank and can find a job and, and live out there because they have nicer weather. One of those was the Holy Spirit. One of those was not. One of those, both of those I actually did and I actually went on. But we can get that sense of, okay, in every moment God wants us to be aware of his presence. So it's not just about those big questions and those big things. And again, that's what St. John Chrysostom was getting at. Was our Lord wanted to show us that it's always around us. The game, in a sense, is always afoot. It's not just about prayer. It's about recognizing where is the presence of God? Because even in the smallest moments, when I was looking at the video from last year, I used the example of, do I, I, I go to the store, I'm thinking, oh, should I get 1% milk or half percent milk? And why would God care about that? Well, why am I consternating over it? Why am I even thinking 1% or half percent? Is, I mean, we're talking, I mean, can you even taste the difference in that? Or do I have someone at home that wanted skim milk and others that want 2%? So do I compromise? Do I get the milk that my mom wants or do I get the milk that my brother wants? And, in that. and I think a lot of times these little decisions that don't seem like anything can actually cause us the most stress over it. And we just can't quite figure it out. Why? Well, maybe because we think that God doesn't really care. But even in those moments, what if it ends up meaning more to your mom to get the milk she wanted than to your brother, or vice versa? We can't actually see and understand what the consequences of our actions are. And even though I may not be able to see or know, okay, why this would be important to God, there's an underlying reality of, is it important to God? Am I important to Him? If it's yes, then yes than in that moment, because maybe by grabbing that half percent milk that happens to be the last one, what actually happens is someone else was going to come and get it, and they didn't, so they get the skim milk instead, which is better for their health. We don't know. But he does desire. So the discernment of spirits really is, it's that awareness of, it's advancing in the spiritual life. Um, Diodocus of Photike, and I think that's how you pronounce his name. If we have any Greek experts, you can help me out here. I, it's a problem not having ever any, heard anyone who's actually pronounced it in an authoritative way. But he was one of the earlier, and I will draw a lot from him 
in my conversations with you all. And what he talked about was quite simply that our advancement in the ability to discern is hand in hand with our advancement in the spiritual life. That as one has progressed in the way of perfection, one has progressed in one's ability to discern the voice and the sound and the presence of the spirits. And that we can actually discern infallibly. And not just him, but all the saints. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about some more set the stage for from the tradition and this idea of discerning and how to go about that. They've all said that, yes, we can discern infallibly. Not that we will, not that we won't make mistakes at times because we're not yet perfect in the spiritual life. But as we progress in that, so we need our prayer, we need our scriptures, we need our fasting, our prayers, our almsgiving, are actually ways of growing in your ability to discern between the spirits of God and the spirits of others to discern what God's will is for you. And even though it seems very difficult, very hard in the beginning, and he warns us, as he says, it's very difficult in the beginning, but then it becomes easier. It's almost daunting and seemingly impossible, but then it becomes easier as you continue to discern and grow. I say that to say it will seem daunting. And when I mention things like he had a hundred rules for discerning, eyes have already bulged out. Okay, start. I want you by next week to memorize rules one through 26. Okay, and you also need to rule. Memorize the first three rules of St. Ignatius, which is in the book that Dan Burke wrote. And you also need to memorize what Saint, the three aspects of discernment that Origen said. I'm not going to do that. Okay. Because one of the things about discerning, too, and again, this comes all of the saints that have testified it, testified to it, and have walked the spiritual life will give a different, use different terminology or different description, but they tell the same story. And there are two main ways and, that I want to share with you. Uh, and you can really see this throughout our history. And I tell you these two ways, and this is why I will use several different theologians and saints, is to see which way works best for you. Okay. Okay, by way of an example, and I hope, and I will try to write big enough for people all the way in the back to see. Um, so the first way is we can tell a story, and it can talk about, you know, this is, this is the cave. And the cave is a place where you go to meet God. We learn this from Elijah. Okay, because we need to go in a place, and one way we can say that by going into the cave, and in this sense, the darkness of our worldly affairs, everything is removed from around us that would distract us. That now, going into this cave, we can listen to that still, small voice of God, and there's a sense of deprivation. And who else would go there but God alone to be with us? Okay. But this cave is about halfway up a mountain. Okay. And by perspective, I may have drawn it a little bit more than halfway up. But this cave is about halfway up the mountain, and as you're trying to get to it, there are boulders and obstacles that you would have to overcome and, and go around, and they're going to try to divert you away from union with God. They're going to try to slow you down. They're going to try, and some of them, you may be standing down here and looking up, and you're like, I can't see the cave because there's this big boulder right there blocking your view and blocking your vision. Okay? So sometimes, even if you can't see it, it tests our faith. God, are you there? I can't sense you. I cannot actually see where you are. This old man told me that this is the way to go, I don't know, can I really trust him? Does he really know? Is he just old and crazy? 
And it tests our faith. Will God actually get us and lead us there, or should I just give up and be done with it? So if you come to this, then you may have to walk around, and you may actually have to go back down the mountain a little at some times. Actually, falling may work, because you may actually fall and find yourself fall down a hill, and then when you get up, you say, oh, now I can see my way around it. So God will actually allow us to fall at times, to get us to where we need to be. So then you can start climbing up the mountain. And as you're climbing up the mountain, you may even come to a great crevice, a great break. And you may think it's impossible, and how do I get over that break? And maybe it is a matter of God's given you the tools so you can cast the line across it to, to climb over. Maybe you do have to go back down. Maybe you have to climb down and go up. This is one way of describing discernment. And this is the way that the early church fathers taught. In the sense of taking different aspects. Because in the end, in climbing the mountain, it's not about the cave. This is the, the way of perfection, the mountain of God. This is the spiritual life. So as you progress up, things become more clearly. That's where you go to meet God, and your discernment will become more sure-footed. Sure and in the early church, they talked more about this. In the sense of, they described, well, you're going, here's this experience, and then there's this. And so they create the picture and the mountain by showing little snippets here and there. Okay? Through the centuries then, another way became, another way to describe this whole scene is just to start off and say, you know, there is a mountain. And it is the mountain of the spiritual life. And to climb this mountain, there are 14 steps. This is step one, two, three, four, five, six. And at step six, you'll come to a cave. And in this cave is where you will experience God. It's a very systematic approach. Painting, drawing the same picture, using a different means and different way. For some of us, for me, this first image works beautifully, works wonderfully. For others, we need that step by step. Diodocus, as I said, in the early church fathers wrote more like, so there will be a hundred rules but they're not in any sequential order. It's learning these things. And this is how you discern. St. Ignatius, and Dan Burke's book um, that I gave you all, um, is based on his, uh, St. Ignatius' 14 Steps of Discernment. Um, and it's a very well done, I think, work taking what can be an old or academic approach and relating it to today's life and some of the challenges that we face. So I'm not going to teach a lot directly from the book, but I will give you reading assignments each week um, from that. And it kind of is structured in a way that goes along with it. But I'll so figure you're reading the book. So while I'll bring some things out of it, this is time for you to get different information from you know, the history of the tradition um, and the saints to pull together so that you can start that route towards spiritual life and discernment and there. I want to pause here, grab a drink of coffee to, so, so I don't start coughing, um, but also any, if anybody has any questions about Okay. Okay, so if I look at my use my right note card, you see for homilies I have one note card. I, I, I've got about four plus four pages uh, up here tonight. Um, and we'll try to I will try to keep the presentation to one one hour. Um, One of the things that Dan Burks points out, so the question of how do we discern? 
And maybe this time, I'll, I'll start this off by asking you all, how do you discern? Do you discern? Prayer. Prayer? Okay. If you want to figure out, okay, uh, discern question of, okay, should I take should I take a particular job or not? What do I want to do for a living? What are some of the contemporary ways and methods that you or we have taught people to discern? Hmm? Pros, and cons. Pro, pros and cons list. Very common one. Not a very good one. <laughs> when I um, first moved out to Washington, D.C., and this was, so I had a calling. I went away from that, was looking at a political career for 10 years. So this was part of that 10-year period where I didn't give any thought to the priesthood and was moved out to D.C. Um, to kind of start and make some connections for a political career. And I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So one of the things, as I was asking around people, said, what, do you have any advice? Is there anything for me to read? So one of them was, what color is your parachute? If any of you have heard of that book, Everyone was saying, this will change your life. It will help you. It will t guide you to exactly what you need to do, um, which is remember to bring an eraser. <laughs> it is also helpful. Oh, thank you. Good discernment. <laughs> the, uh, I read it and thought, well, this didn't help me. Why is, why is everybody raving about this book? Uh, another one from that time period, uh, Awaken the Giant Within. Okay, I, I actually found a lot in that. I thought it was very helpful and had some good, did have some good wisdom in there, um, but still, you know, that still remains, it's all about finding out what I enjoy, what brings me life in there. These are things that Dan Burke calls counterfeit solutions. Other voices. So there are other voices other than God that tell us, okay, if you want to discern, this is what you need to do. You make your list of pros and cons. Okay. Or... Uh, you know, question, what do you want to do? The Myers-Briggs personality, that's a big one that I did in one of our, a couple of my religious communities in that, that will. Or the Enneagram, in that. that making a list of questions, what do I want out of life? What gives me joy? These kind of things. Well, what job will actually get me to where I want to go? Um, pretty much everything that we have been taught about discernment is wrong. And I will even say what I was led through in trying to discern the priesthood and what a lot of our vocations offices and directors, I'm not singling anyone out in particular in case you ever meet Father Reeb, our vocation director. I'm not singling, I'm not, this is not about him. But just in general is we're wrong because when it look, comes to discernment, okay, and this again, in different ways, all of the saints and doctors will talk about this. There are really four areas. Okay. There, so we have the knowledge of God. Okay. Problem with pros and cons, problem with the Enneagram, problem with Myers-Briggs, all of these things is, where is God in it? Or even if I ask the question, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Or, God, if I make this free throw, that means you want me to become a priest. 
Does that work? How many of us, how many of you have tried something similar? Oh, if this cake turns out well, I'm going to be a baker. <laughs> right? Well, maybe God wanted the cake to turn out well for your grandmother for her birthday because he didn't want her to suffer. But he wants you to become a priest or a teacher. Or it totally unrelated. How often do we put forth questions that we think may be holy and may be good? Or even to say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? I will say that's a bad question. Because that presumes God wants to tell me clearly right now what his plan for me is. Okay, maybe he needs me to go different paths along the mountain, and if he tells me what, what my final destination is, I'm not the type of person to get there. I may be the type of person, if he had said, you know, um, you know, if he'd said when I was five years old, Kendall, I want you to become a priest, then my, my potential career as a professional ninja, I've shared that with many before, <laughs> or all of the different aspects of, you know, that would have changed my life so much in playing basketball, in the search, in the search, trying to figure out what I wanted to do is what has led me to live in, I think, 11 different states. It's what led me on that journey where my car broke down because I threw a rod in the middle of South Carolina and got in, into, before cell phones, got into a van that had all the windows blacked out because it was the only one who stopped by to give me a ride in the middle of nowhere, South Carolina, and then proceeded to take off the interstate and one turn and another turn and onto gravel roads and is saying, yes, I have my friend, he's a mechanic, he'll, he'll, he's got a tow truck, he can get you. And I start thinking, okay, I'm glad I'm a runner. <laughs> because I can, and it was a serious thought. And then he pulls in and there's the tow truck and his friend. Okay. So many of our experiences, if he God answered the, the question we put to him, when we want it answered, would change our life and our path. So even saying, God, what do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want me to do with my life. Bad question. That's not what knowledge of God is. Knowledge of God is knowledge of his commandments. Okay. It's seeing, and part of it is knowing, recognizing our blessings, recognizing his presence in our lives. You know, what is it that actually, what, and sometimes we can say, what do I do that brings good fruit that I can see God's blessing upon and that he has favor upon? Because he will do that too. There are times when we'll just be fruitless, faultless. And it, no matter what we do, it just doesn't work out. It almost works out. Well, maybe seeing, taking a look back and saying, okay, where has God blessed my life? Oh, in my drawing. He's been present there. So maybe that's part of, okay. Knowledge of who he is. So this could be intellectually, but also spiritually. So receiving the Eucharist going to confession, all the ways, knowing God himself. Okay, As St. Teresa of Avila says, how can you know the taste of God if you don't spend time with him? Have you ever thought about, hmm, what does God taste like? What does he feel like? But I know each of you have had times when you're like, I can feel God's presence. But unless you spend time in his presence, time in that cave that I talked about before, time in silence with him, time serving him in works of charity and serving the poor, it's harder to recognize his presence in those times that are darker and more confusing than there. So we've got to know God. The one that's already been talked about, prayer. 
And here again, we can say, how do you know the taste of God, what he sounds like without spending time, but also just in your daily prayer life, speaking to him and giving him an opportunity to speak to you, letting him know what your real desires are. And even prayers of, Lord, please, I cannot see you. I, can't, I don't know where you are. Please show me, be more clear. I mean, even within this last year, there have been times when I said, Lord, I think this is what you want me to do, but maybe I should know, but I don't. I need you to be more clear. Is this your voice? That's the question. Is this your voice? And that's the question he rewards. It's, help me, Lord, be confident. This is Gideon and the story of the fleece. Because the difference between Gideon's apparent doubt and maybe Abraham and Sarah, Sarah's doubt who got punished for it, or Zechariah's doubt who lost his voice, they were saying, is this possible? Gideon didn't say, Lord, is this possible? He said, Lord, I need to know that this is you, that this is your voice, that you are commanding me to take this small number of troops because I don't want to, because if it's you, we'll be victorious. If it's not you, we'll lead to death. There's discernment in a nutshell. If we're following God's voice, it's to victory guaranteed. If we're not, it's to death. So he says, Gideon says, Lord, so in the morning when I wake, the whole ground will be damp and wet except for this fleece. The fleece will be dry. And of course, in the morning, he woke up, he arose, the ground was wet, the fleece was dry. He should get it, right? But he says, no, forgive me for being obstinate, but Lord, just so I know that this is you, when I rise in the morning, this time let the fleece be wet and the ground be dry. And the next morning, the fleece was wet and the ground was dry. That's the one, that's the question that God rewards. He rewards that sense of loyalty, that desire of, Lord, I want to be sure it's you. I don't want to make a misstep. And Diodocus and others will say one of the rules of discernment is, when you do not know what to do, when the answer is unclear and you're uncertain, do nothing. Don't change your course. Okay. Why? Because so many more times than we can know from our experience. If you've ever had a case where, well, I don't know if I should say something or I should challenge this person. That, and we've been afraid. It's like, oh, I'm afraid if I don't say anything, they're just going to continue to do that. And it'll be my fault. So out of a fear for not doing anything, we do something. And how often does that actually cause harm versus how often does it turn out to be the right thing? Pretty much without fail, if we're confused, we're uncertain, and we act out of that uncertainty, it almost always ends up not turning out good. And that, even though we still try. But to even remember, and discernment is learning from, from our experiences. The things of, oh, I think this may be God. I think I may do this. Oh, this was a mistake. So what was that experience? Why did I do it? Oh, I did it because I was anxious. You know, or I thought, yeah, I was, you know, wanted to show everyone in the class how smart I was. And I ended up opening my mouth and showing them how stupid I was. Why? Because, oh, I just, because my driving force was I wanted to say something. It was pride that was driving me. Okay. Rather than, you know, a sense of, no, I, I want to share, raise this question because I think others probably have this question too. Because I really want to know. And if it's out of virtue, you know, that we know God is present, which that gives us the third area. 
Okay. Virtues. We could also describe these are the action, these are actions, those things that bring life. That's why they're called virtues. A virtue cannot lead to death, in a sense. Otherwise, it's a vice. That's why we name things there. Things like prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. Okay. Can kind of get an idea of, uh, of where this is going. Of faith, hope, love, of chastity, of generosity, of temperance, of brotherly love. Fruits of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Not an accident that this is part of discernment. Those things that are one, an expression of generosity, or lead us to generosity and more generous behavior, or to become more kind. So am I acting out of kindness or am I acting out of selfishness? Okay. And am I acting out of, am I wanting to eat, and I've used these before, I should come up with more different examples, but the, the bag of gummy bears. Am I acting out of this gluttonous, uncontrollable, okay, does God want me to eat more gummy bears because I just can't stop? Or am I acting out of temperance and saying, well, you know, it's Easter season. I fasted all Lent, so let me have some gummy bears. Please don't buy me gummy bears for Easter. <laughs> I realize as I say that, <laughs> Um, as I say, give the example of gummy bears, think, oh, I got an idea. Father really likes this. Okay. Um, I still have some from my mom, what my mom gave me for Christmas. So. Okay. Okay. So the other, then the fourth area is self-knowledge. These would be things, easy things to know, okay, what are, what are my gifts, what are my skills, what are my talents? That's where a lot of the contemporary ways of discernment talk about. Um, but not only that, but those interior movements, what's happening inside of me, why? A couple years ago, I, I was um, at my mom's for, for a night and a half. And one of the reasons, and I still get down there once a month usually, um, I was very, of course, very stressed out. I didn't realize how much busier I would become. But, and I had just been talking to her about, you know, how at that time I was seeing about 30 to 35 spiritual direction appointments a month. Um, there. And I was having, for the first time, I was scheduling appointments four to six weeks ahead. Where someone called me, I could not meet with them for a month. And that just, it was stressing me out. I was very bothered by that. And one of my brother priests calls her up and says, uh, Father, would you be able to, uh, you know, cover a mass for me on Saturday? And I said, I'll, I'll have to think about it. And I was thinking about it, even though just within an hour I had been talking about how stressed, how packed, because when I looked at my calendar, it was, I forget the exact time, but it was like a three o'clock mass on Saturday. And yes, I had things going up to one o'clock and then at five o'clock. So I had a little window, even though I had no idea when, I, I was already thinking, I don't know when I'm going to sit down to look at the readings for the homily. And I spent a couple of hours trying to concentrate and say, man, I don't, I can do this, but, sh but I really don't want to. And I start, I looked to the interior movements. And what I listened to that internal voice saying, okay, why don't I want, why I'm all, this stressed out, I'm this busy, so why don't I want to tell him no? And I felt that sense of because 
I want to be someone they can always count on. You know, I, I, I want them to be able to call me whenever they need something and I can provide. And if I tell them no, they're going to stop even asking me. And that made the decision for me. Because it was, it was a matter of pride. This is where self-knowledge also helps out, saying this is my voice. It wasn't God's voice saying do this. It was me saying I wish I could. It's also about knowing our own tendencies. I did have um, a bit of a broken family growing up, which for me that developed in the sense of a close relative. I did not know if he loved me or not. You know. uh, now, this is, these are things I didn't realize and make all the connections till much later. But that's really was overhanging is, hey, man, I just, I doubted if he loved me or not. So I had a tendency in other relationships, and especially with women I was dating, of, I tell you what, if I talked to them in the morning and they didn't call me that night, I'm wondering, do they care? Are we on our way to break up? Is this heading over? To be really suspect of the question of, do they really love me? Okay, And aware that, so a doubt, if someone was getting closer to someone else, or the relationship was falling apart, had nothing to do with them. So discernment is, do, should I call or not? My voice was telling me, you, you got to call because you need to know. But that was my voice. That wasn't God's voice. We say God is present in every decision, every moment. He truly is. And if I can identify, if I can grow in that self-knowledge, I can know in my tendencies, then I can be more aware of the times when I'm wanting to do something. Maybe I'm wanting to leave a job because maybe it is a fear of commitments. Maybe it is I'm just ready for my boss to fire me and don't want that to happen. But in my mind, they can cl those things can cloud our mind, cloud our vision, and we can start rationalizing it and thinking, okay, yes, this is why God would want me to leave and quit my job, and I should have faith that something else would come. Okay. So self-knowledge, knowing our tendencies, being able to perceive those interior movements of when we just have that divine confidence of, I know I haven't won the game yet, but I'm going to. Or I haven't got the job, but I'm going to. Or the diocese hasn't accepted me yet, but they're going to. We all have that sense of, you know, that times when we felt that confidence or that peace or that calmness, okay? And we need all of these. So all of those counterfeit methods. So if all we do is pray. I had one lady come up to me when I was working in the coffee shop in the Columbia Public Library and was telling me about how God had sent her on a mission to be homeless and, and to preach on the corner because it came to her in prayer. If all we do is pray, we can get pulled out and focus because we can get deceived. We need that knowledge of God. Or if, you know, all I'm trying to do is feed my family, and that's virtuous, right? So let me go rob the bank. But that's against God's commandments. Okay? So, and that's the thing, the counterfeit, the things that we have been taught about how to discern almost always just focus on one of these areas of discernment or maybe pull into a second one. But it really needs all, because what it is is these God speaks in all these ways so that it can give us that anchor to be more certain. God, is this your voice? And again, if it is talking if if the voice we have is calling us to act unjustly or to act greedily. Okay. then the chances of that 
being God is a lot smaller and smaller. Okay. And the idea of discernment is not to pull from those. Okay. I'm going to pause. Questions? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm repeating the question for the for the recording also is that sense of being taught that should not ask for a sign like God if this is you then let this happen okay uh, so unless you are like Gideon probably shouldn't ask for a sign okay um, with, with that great virtue. We can also, because in discernment though, so we would say he was one that was well up the mountain by that time, and God had come to him and said, given him a command. Okay. So again, it's also in a response, and that's versus me just saying, Lord, if this is, you know, if I'm supposed to, um, if I'm supposed to leave the priesthood, then let my car start. Okay. <laughs> because obviously that means you want me to get away from this place and never come back. We could make... Okay. So there, there is already a starting point. But when you get to discernment, um, are we putting something in God's mind? A, a good example too is uh, St. Scholastica and Benedict. Okay. And that sense of praying for something versus, Lord, I pray that your will is done. And that story is, of course, Benedict was visiting Scholastica. Um, and she knew that that was her last night. Okay. And again, she's well along the road to perfection, along the spiritual life. And Benedict is going to leave and Scholastica prays to God. Okay to make it so he can't leave. She prays for the storm, and the storm comes, and they stay up all night talking. Benedict leaves, and she dies. Okay, That's kind of gutsy, saying, Lord, I know this is your will. But in discernment, so what I would say without knowing anything else would be that she did discernment into that, that discerning of, Lord, is it your will for him to leave or not? And she knew that that was her last night that she was going to die. So she was not praying to convince God to do something. But there was already that union of wills in there. And she recognized what God's will is. That um, the union of wills, if I can jump then... Um, I guess I'm right here, so I should jump, make make the jump. Um, is t just to hit on a few of the particular um, saints and how they describe discernment. Um, Saint Alphonsus Liguori describes it, and this is one of the handouts, the excerpts that I gave to you to read, as uniformity with God's will. We could say in very simple terms, this is what discernment is. Lord, what is your will? Recognizing it, and then making the choice to conform and follow it. So in that sense, too, he recognizes there are two, two steps, two stages to discernment. The one is to discern to see where is God present, and then we actually have to make the choice to follow his presence. And lead. He says, the greatest glory we can give God is to do his will in everything. Yes. Uh, so that, okay, so there is the full excerpt, chapter one, um, is Uniformity with God's Will by St. Alphonsus Liguori. Um, the, what I just read from, so there is the main outline, Discernment of Spirits, week one. On the back, 
or some excerpts discernment from the tradition. Okay. No, thank you. I skipped that part in the beginning. So, uh, so this again, he reminds us that it's not, there's no particular action that we could say is always the right good thing to do. Okay. In the sense of because maybe in a particular situation or circumstance, yes, always follow virtues, but um, we can address cash in with this also. Fasting, fasting is a good thing. Okay. And he is the, the father of monasticism. So he wrote in his conferences, in his second conference, he, he was writing to the, his monks and warning them of the need for discretion, which is also discernment. Okay, so for discretion. Because he said it's valuable and necessary as knowledge and the other gifts of the whole, sorry, um, that even great and holy men have lost all that they had gained in spiritual rewards because they failed to use proper discretion. One of the particular specific groups is those that they would fast. And that there were actually monks that because fasting was good and our Lord fasted for 40 days, they would be on day 20 and want be hungered and needing to eat but would not eat because fasting was good and they would faint and die. And that's where we could say it's following God's will, not the specific action. And we can get caught up in that. The Carmelites talk about this as detachment and being attached to things. That John of the Cross in his terminology would say, no thing but God alone. Because we can even be attached to good holy things like fasting, like keeping vigil over the Eucharist, like giving the greatest and best homily, like um, giving to the poor, to the... But... What I said is, these are good insofar as they lead us closer to God. The rosary is good insofar as it leads us closer to God. But there can be at a time when maybe we're saying, Father, I need to pray more. I don't pray enough rosaries. Or the rosary has lost its kind of appeal to me. It's dry. It's become rote. What am I doing wrong? I'm not being attentive enough or I'm being distracted and can start condemning ourselves because the prayer doesn't feel right. Okay. Where maybe what God is asking is saying at a time, yes, the rosary was life-giving, was drawing you to his blessed mother, drawing you closer. Maybe you learn more to pray for others. Maybe it helped teach you to, to stop and be quiet and, and focus more on being in God's presence because you didn't have to focus in on the words because they're just becoming rhythmic and it really brought you. But you'd say, so if this is the mountain again, so yes, the rosary brought you up here and if all you ever pray is the rosary in your life, maybe you're going to be stuck here and God wants you to keep going and draw closer. There's the akathis to, to the Theotokos which some prayed with our Eastern brothers and sisters on Our Lady of Guadalupe together, which is a beautiful, in the East, they don't pray the rosary very much, but they pray the Akathis a lot. And actually, all of their hours of prayer throughout the day have a Marian prayer. Maybe it's becoming dry because God wants to pull you into these other prayers and draw you closer to the Blessed Mother in another way. But if we stay attached, for me, the Our Father, when I first really renewed my life with Christ, I took very seriously those words we heard today. When you pray, pray this. I thought, okay, I should only pray the Our Father because that's what Scripture tells us to do. Okay. And, it, it, and I would take 45, 50 minutes and I could pray the Our Father one time in that. And then there's a time when it stopped being less fulfilling. And if I stayed attached to that and said, I, no, I'm going to force it 
it's dry, but I, it says only pray the Our Father, then I would not have gone more towards adoration, contemplative prayer, learning more prayers to our Blessed Mother, the prayers of Alphonsus Liguori, the Universal Prayer of Clement, so many other ways that my life, prayer life became enriched. And it's the same way in discerning. We may become attached to a specific thing rather than God's will. Okay. And also take from that what Cassian is talking about. If we think that, oh, I discern well, I discern great, I don't need to use discernment. He was talking to monks that lived in the desert, men who were well along on the holy path and holy life. And he said this, yes, you have advanced far in holiness, but even the holiest of people without discretion can fall victim to the pitfalls and to stumble. And there really were brothers who were dying because they felt they needed to continue fasting more in that. That's a time where being in the desert, if you fainted and passed out, there was nobody to come revive you on that. Okay. Cashin spoke about in terms of discretion. Origin of Alexandria, and I'm aware on time, so I'm going to finish up here in about five minutes. Um, Origin is whom I consider the greatest scripture scholar and mind that has ever lived. Uh, in the East, he is considered a doctor and a saint. Uh, in the West, not so much because of, and I just have to give this disclaimer, when it comes to philosophy, he phrased things in a way that could lead into trouble and misinterpretation. Okay. His scripture, he weaves it so beautifully and most of us we come up with ideas and we interpret scripture. We go along and we get to a point like, oh wait, but this contradicts. And we have to correct. I've seen no contradiction um, in his, his interpretations of it. What he describes, he says, discernment is concerned with the movements of the soul and their correct management. This is discernment recognizing God, and then the decision, the correct management. So in this, he addresses the two parts, which others have described, as I said, discerning and choosing. And the discernment is dependent on three aspects. Self-knowledge, moral character, and, he said, and the third, participation in the mind of Christ which I think in the same language, the knowledge of God and prayer is participation in Christ. Okay, that needs those two aspects. Okay. St. <clears throat> Teresa of Jesus um, already mentioned, how can one expect to know what God tastes like unless one spends time with him? Dom Lorenzo Scupoli, Scupoli um, in the spiritual combat. And when I first read the spiritual combat, I was thinking, okay, this is getting into prayers of deliverance and of exorcism. And when I started tonight saying that spiritual warfare, those kinds of things are a part of it, okay, he helped me to see how, yes, that's just a part of it. As I was reading, what he really describes is the path to the way of perfection and advancing in the spiritual life. And it's he who said that to attain Christian perfection, we have been given four weapons. And without it, it is impossible to gain victory in this spiritual combat. What is victory? Victory is not the temporary winning against temptation. That's a small victory. That's maybe the battle. Okay. The victory he's talking about, the victory in the spiritual combat is life of perfection, climbing up the mountain, union with Christ, union with God. That's the war. Okay. Discernment of spirits is saying, God, how do I reach you? How do I draw closer to you? 
Okay, the four components, he says, are necessary. Distrust of self. Okay. That, doesn't that fly in the face of modern thought? Distrust of self. Okay. This is not saying getting rid of self-knowledge. Talked about the three voices, God, the evil one, and yourself, this is yourself. Knowing this is my voice, so I should distrust it because I don't know the way to perfection. And confidence in God. And trusting that if this is God's will, if this is his voice, he is leading me to goodness. How often can we recognize and say, yeah, God, I know you want me to do this, but this looks better. Or I don't think that's going to work out. You know, saying, Lord, I know you want me to leave, but I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going to lose all the people I know if I move, if I leave here. So I can't do it. I'm too afraid. I don't know what's on the other side. Okay. It's having that confidence. If this is what God is saying, then it will bear good fruit. And he knows where it's going. The third, uh, he says, is proper use of faculties. Versus, that versus the misuse of our talents. Faculties being the use of reason, the use of thought, our abilities, our skills. Everything can either be used for God or opposed to God. So discernment is, in this practical way, saying, do everything for God. Because if you do it against God, you're not gonna be it's gonna be hard to follow him. Okay. And the final one is daily prayer. Okay. Again, you have to spend time with God to be able to recognize him. Okay. And Diodicus of Photoche. It says that the discernment of spirits is where theology meets praxis. So if you're feeling like a lot of this talks, if you get overloaded in the theology and understanding of God and the Holy Trinity, it says discernment of spirits is every, where everything we know about God meets our daily life. And this he's writing from the 5th century. So we think of these guys as ancient long ago and out of touch. And maybe even think of our ancient writers and the church fathers as having this high theology. Okay, they're looking at heaven, their mind's way up there. It's not down in the day to day. He's saying, no, discernment is where theology meets practice, where everything you know about God and can recognize about God connects to what your daily trials and tribulations and questions are. Even something as simple, and I'll close tonight with, with this example. Um, you know, I think. When um, I was in the, my last year in the seminary, and Bishop Johnson was coming out to meet us. And I was at the seminary with one other uh, classmate who did not he ended up discerning out, but there's one other, his name was Eric. And Eric was going to the airport in Cincinnati to pick up the bishop. And I'd asked him, I said, Eric, okay, when, you're, when you get back, when you pull into the drive, please let me know and I can come down and meet you. Because it would be, by the time he parked, it'd be a couple of minutes and I could meet him and say hello to the bishop when he arrived. And I kind of did the calculating. I think it was... I'd figured out he'd be, they'd arrive maybe 7.15 at the earliest, probably about 7.30. But about 7 o'clock, I reached a breaking, stopping point in the paper I was working on, and kind of felt like, well, I want to go outside now, but I should wait until 7.15. And then I thought, no, if I just go ahead and if I go for a walk, when Eric calls, I'll be right there and I can I can meet him. So I go down, 
open the door, and in walks the bishop. Just like I had opened the door for him. But it was dark outside and light inside. So no, I, it was a surprise. I open and, oh, very welcome, good to see you. Okay. There was actually a movement. And I think God was actually saying, go ahead. Okay, you hit a time, so go ahead and go ahead and leave. And I tried, I was using my intellect saying, no, they're not going to be back for another 15 minutes. And that made sense. Calculate it out. I forget. I mean, he was just very quick getting out of the airport. But nothing I had figured out was wrong. But God says, you know what? I, I want you, even though your friend dropped the ball because he did not call me and let me know, he kind of, God kind of stepped in. And I could have very easily just ignored that. But discernment is... God, where are you present? Because if I follow where you are present, I will be where you want me to be, and what better place can I be than there? So short of it is, everything that we have been taught about discernment is wrong, it's a hard road at the beginning, but you can discern God's presence infallibly. And in these next four weeks, we'll get more into how do I recognize, you know, whether this is a desolation or a consolation. What is desolation? What is consolation? Um, how do these different areas work out and integrate um, and move along in that step and that? I'll, two minutes for questions. I will stay afterward if anyone has one-on-one, -on -one, but give an opportunity. On the surface, it seems mm. very intellectual, like it's, it's just happening in your mind. But I, I, I'm sure there's more to it than that, because you know, knowledge is, is an intellectual exercise, and virtue is a choice. Mm -hmm. So uh, in prayer, it's an act of formation. But is, is the point here the intellectual exercise or getting the spirit in alignment to, to okay. So the question is, it seems very intellectual, and is the point to stay intellectual or is there some degree of aligning the spiritual with the intellect? So I would say a recognition is that there's not a contradiction between the intellect and the spirit. Sometimes we may want to think of it that way. The, the, the opposition is between the physical and the spirit. The intellect, there's a sp physical component and a spiritual component. Physical component say, is, yes, you can take drugs to keep you from being depressed. And they affect the mind. And when the chemicals affect the mind, it can affect our attitude, our ability to think. It can affect our intellect. So there's very much a physical. But there is also, um, because we're physical and spiritual beings, there is a mere equal spiritual aspect to it. Um, so there is part of it that is intellectual knowledge. Um, but there's also, there is a feeling, sensing, and that sense of peace. Uh, that sense of, oh, this is the right thing to do. And it's coming back, it's becoming more aware of the spiritual presence, I would say, of our intellect, our use of reason, our senses we have, not to get too far into it, but just as we have the physical senses of sight, of taste, of hearing, we have, our spirit has the spiritual senses. If you ever doubted that, have you ever just known something? Have you ever felt God's peace? That ain't no, that's not a physical thing. There's a physical manifestation at times. But, yeah, it's okay.
Okay. Next week, um, and I gave you a handout that's got the five-week schedule, is the basic principles of discernment. And I realize that I did not include the sheet. I had a sheet noted on here as far as what um, chapters, what parts of Dan Burke's book to read. I do not have it on here. So what I may suggest is if you have the My Parish app, I, I will include a I will include a message announcement through the My Parish app um, on there, uh, and as just a preliminary, I would suggest reading the introductory part of Dan Burke's book. Not you'll get into rules. Stop reading. I mean, you can keep reading, but for next week, we're just going to be on the introductory part. Okay, and start on the basic principles of discernment. So, let us conclude in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for these and all thy gifts we receive through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.